Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our post Purim edition of uh, Rip from the Headlines. And uh, we'll cover a couple of topics uh, from the headlines as we head into uh, Pesach. If anyone has any specific uh, Pesach headlines they've seen and uh, want to bring them to my attention, happy to uh, consider them for uh, discussion. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, in vitro fertilization. And uh, it's something that has been in the news uh, since uh, a recent Alabama Supreme Court decision uh, last month. But it's something that uh, crossed my radar screen uh, back in January, where there was uh, a news uh, coverage of, you see source number one, has the New York Times coverage of it. Uh, Francis... Pope Francis urges ban on surrogacy, calling it despicable. So that you know crossed my uh, radar screen. If you're wondering why the New York Times, um, sometimes when you search, when I search back for articles or headlines, they have, they do pretty well on the uh, um, on the algorithm, I guess. Uh, when searching for news uh, on Google, I'm sure there's other ways to look uh, for for news and get it. But you know we're trying to stick to the news and not the editorial or the op-ed uh, pages. But uh, so this was the, the the news report. Pope Francis on Monday called surrogate motherhood a despicable practice that should be universally banned for its commercialization of pregnancy, including the practice among wars, terrorism, and other threats to peace and humanity. In annual speech to ambassadors, an unborn child must not be turned into an object of trafficking. Francis said. He added, "I consider despicable the practice of so-called surrogate motherhood, which represents a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child." based on the exploitation of situations of the mother's material needs. Right? Women get paid to be surrogates. A child who said should never be the basis of a commercial contract and called for a global ban on surrogacy to prohibit this practice universally. Right? A very conservative approach in line with the what we know of or familiar with the Catholic Church's uh, conservative stance on you know, these types of uh, reproductive issues. However, just to know what's the state of play around the world, surrogacy is already illegal in Italy, and compensated surrogacy is also legal, Ill illegal or restricted in much of Europe. The United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Portugal, and several other nations allow surrogacy under certain conditions. Paid surrogacy is legal in some European nations, including Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. Surrogate mothers in the U.S. and Canada are often hired by Europeans, including same-sex couples seeking to have children. So some American states have outlawed the practice. So, you know, we've seen uh, and we've discussed surrogacy uh, from a Jewish perspective in the past. Um, I saw this headline. I thought maybe we will further explore it. But the article also mentions the Catholic Church has long opposed surrogacy, as it has in vitro fertilization for a variety of ethical and theological reasons. So that allowed me to take the headline I filed away in January into pivot to this case, which... Uh, uh, grabbed headlines last month and continues to be discussed as in terms of what the issue of abortion and other uh, reproductive issues will be in terms of in politics and upcoming elections and the like. And here's the New York Times coverage of the Supreme Court, uh, Alabama Supreme Court decision, source number two. An Alabama Supreme Court's ruling that frozen embryos and test tubes should be considered children has sent shockwaves through the world of reproductive medicine casting doubt over fertility care for would-be parents in the state and raising complex legal questions with implications extending far beyond Alabama. The judges issued the ruling on Friday in appeals cases brought by couples whose embryos were destroyed in 2020 when a hospital patient removed frozen embryos from tanks of liquid nitrogen in Mobile and dropped them on the floor. Note to selves, liquid nitrogen is really, really cold. So, if, And actually what happened, someone walked in, grabbed it, dropped it. Um, referencing anti-abortion language in the state's constitution, the judge's majority opinion said that 18, an 1872 statute allowing parents to sue over the wrongful death of a minor child applies to unborn children, with no exception for extra uterine children. It has become standard medical protocol during in reach for fertilization to extract as many eggs as possible from a woman, then to fertilize them to create embryos before freezing them. Generally, only one embryo is transferred at a time into the uterus in order to maximize the chances of successful implantation in a full-term pregnancy. But what if we can't freeze them? Ms. Kalura asks. Will we hold people criminally liable because you can't freeze a person? This opens up so many questions. And you know, in particular, the uh, the, the the issue. Uh, the issue of uh, 
you know, the, the issue in this case was that when parents heard that their the, that the uh, eggs had been destroyed, they sued for damages, and there's different types of damages. This was not so much the case of a, uh, was it a criminal case, but was it for damages, there's different levels of damages, one in terms of just general damages and one when it's when it's when it's damage to a person property damage versus person damage and that was the situation and um that was uh the case that was dealt with and that's the case that is being dealt with and, and the like so the, the really the you know the the uh, alabama supreme court said based on this statute to sue for wrongful death they applied it to the embryos even the, and, and by saying that there was no uh doesn't matter if it's uh, inside or outside. It's a person, and you can sue for wrongful death. Uh, we'll stop any questions, reactions uh, into the headlines before we jump into uh, the article. Uh, okay. So um I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. I'm just saying when a woman has a period, all these embryos are being discarded every month, like hundreds of millions of embryos are being discarded. So that, you know, at, at that stage well, of the embryo. Well, well, remember that's that's nature. Um, you know, the, the, the member, the, the, you know, again, you know, it's like the, the, the biology there, that's not a fertilized egg. That's why it's coming out. Um, you know, sometimes if it gets fertilized and there's an early uh, miscarriage, that's what's coming out. But that's not being done. That's not there's nothing. Be, there's nothing proactive on that. That's what that's the that is what's happening. Um, so that that you know moves us away from the uh, abortion conversation per se um here the real issue is you know we're not we're not going to reopen you know we talked about abortion uh after the Dodd case last year but um but um with regards to you know what what is the question here is is that it, it is an embryo considered a life um and it definitely has impact on the abortion discussion and we'll you know we'll see that, you know it's kind of the cases are kind of with each other, they're next to each other. They're definitely aligned, um, but it's not necessarily one and the same. Um, you know, I think we're going to see that you can have a more restrictive view on abortion while still seeing these embryos as not necessarily being humans, and uh, we'll have to see you know what kind of uh, guidance we have from halakha to uh, to uh, you know to guide us in the. Uh, to, to guide us in this conversation. You know, I, I think suffice it to say, without, you know, rehashing all of the, the discussions we had previously on abortion, Judaism is not monolithic. It has certain restrictive, very restrictive voices on abortion that considers it murder. You have uh, those who consider abortion absolutely prohibited, but not murder. And then you have kind of the, the opening for a more uh, of the open discussion as to situations where Judaism would uh, allow uh, an abortion to take place. And so I think it's, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, we're going to be sidling up to that issue, but not in it exactly. And, you know, so let me, maybe let's see what this looks like in terms of some of the sources. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, you know, one of the ones that may be even already coming to mind for those of you who are a little more familiar with the topic or we studied uh, in the class before is a, Famous statement of the Talmud found in Yevamot uh, 69b. It's in source number three, where basically the uh, Talmud says, Rav Chisa says, until 40 days from conception, the fetus is merely water. This is Maya Ba'alma. Uh, and this is the idea you know, that, that has a lot of relevance with regards to what they call the morning after pill. It has you know, relevance to just idea what, what you know, if, in, in these immediate days of uh, post fertilization and right right after conception what's the status right, we know that very early on or very quickly it starts to develop but what's the status in the opening days and the Talmud has this idea it's Maya Ba'alma and what is, does that mean uh, we can just say uh, you know that, that it's completely not human and abortion is completely okay in those first 40 days well in fact there was a view Rabbi Shlomo Drimmer source number four uh, talks about 
that um, you know they're talking about a situation, uh, you know, where where someone, uh, you know, where a woman is injured and within is just within the first forty days. He says, "Uberu pachos mi mem yom," middle of the first line. Velo nigmara tzura so hadai, and it hasn't taken on any official form. Can avoid permission of self per kamapolis. The ein bo chius klal. It's not considered alive at all. Near lafia ni asdati the ein bo iser v'al penoch and nera gozeh. There's no prohibition whatsoever, either for a Jew or for a non-Jew. You know, when we had a discussed abortion, we noticed that that there are those who feel that even if Judaism halacha allows for abortion in some situations, it may be more restrictive on Noahides, non-Jews, and we'll have to you know refer back to that discussion at this time. But here you have someone who says, look, the Talmud in Yevamot says Maya ba'alma. That this uh, situation, it, it's water, it's not alive at all. And therefore, there's this period of 40 days where it's not considered alive. You know, so if you just take that entire discussion about the frozen embryos, well, you know, frozen embryos haven't started to develop yet. You've stopped the development process by freezing them. They would be considered within those 40 days. Maya ba'alma, it just has no life at all. And we have, we, we have here a very open and shut case from a Jewish law perspective. Uh, that uh, that uh, you know, with regards to, in terms of this Alabama Supreme Court decision, it's not life. Now, you know where this gets a little bit more complicated is the uh, we 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 can pivot to a question about and you know Judy, Jewish law is very good at pivoting to parallel situations, right? You don't always get the answers to your questions about this you know this aspect of Jewish law only in one place. Um, you know, what the, the the question was asked about um, what about violating Shabbat pikuach nefesh to medically treat the woman or the fetus in the first forty days? I right? usually say you can break Shabbat to save a life. Okay, well, let's say the fetus in the first forty days is in danger. If it's not alive, then you can't do anything to save the life because it's not alive. So this was something that, you know, and that impacts the discussion about what's the status of the fetus in the first 40 days, which impacts the abortion discussion. But for our purposes, it gives us some indication as to whether or not an embryo is considered a life at all. Um, for, you know, so the, the, the halachists primarily were discussing a situation of a woman who is in those first days after the fertilization of conception. Rabbi Isser Yehuda Unterman, who was... Uh, uh, one of the chief rabbis of Israel, uh, the uh, I believe he succeeded Rabbi Herzog, that chief rabbi of Israel, so the, the, the second chief rabbi in the state of Israel. And uh, he's discussing uh, an opinion of Ramban, Nachmanides, with regards to um, the idea that, uh, that, that uh, killing the fetus would be considered uh, murder. So the time of the milshir is partial to Ramban. Gam lifnei arba'im yom and mechal in Shabbat after hukamayav ama. Even before forty days, we would violate Shabbat, even though it's just water. Nearly no more can't keep keep kuach nefesh anudonim gam al masha asilios beli puula no sevus vidarko shalola because kuach nefesh when we're going to evaluate the fetus, even though it's within forty days, and the Talmud may still consider it maya ba'ama just water, we're going to evaluate it in the, the biggest picture, that even if I technically have a definition that's not fully life now, but we know that the, where is this going? Please God, it develops into a full life. So it's almost, we look at where this is going. It, it brings to mind the uh, uh, Al Shem Sofo, right? That where it's going to be. This, uh, you know, comes to, uh, com comes to mind uh, similar to the Ben Sora Remore. Right? We talk about that wayward child who's being uh, executed under very specific conditions, which may or not may not be able to take place, but is being killed. Why are you killing this little, you know, twelve-year-old uh, boy now? And so the rabbis say, "Al Shem Sofa, where he's going." Right? That's as opposed to Yishmael, who is saved uh, from thirst after Avram kicks out Hagar uh, and Yishmael. Why is Yishmael saved? Even though he's going to cause so much trouble later on. Hirsch, you got to know this one. Well, if you unmute it, I can read your lips. Basher Husham. Right? Yishmael is being judged where he is. Right? And sorry, the, I was muted. I was uh, muted. Sorry. I was, I was reading sorry. your lips. <laughs> but but, but then so more I'll shame Sofo. In a certain way here, what Rabbi Untiman is saying is that you know, he, the within 40 days, the fetus may not be, mm -hmm. it's not alive, but it's part of life. 
And so therefore, um, you're allowed to, uh, you're allowed to that's the Darko Shalom. Let's be realistic here. And so that's, uh, so you would be allowed to violate Shabbos in this situation. It's not really, it's going to be alive, but it's not really alive. Right, you're not you're clearly not allowed to do any damage to it, even if it's in the first 40 days. It's, it's gonna happen according to the Darko Shalom, the way of the world. And so on the one hand, Maya Baalma leads to you know Rabbi Drummer's contention that it's that's it, that's Maya Baalma. But it's not, he doesn't address the Shabbos situation for the most part. You know, the, the, there is the, the, the idea that, for example, Judaism countenances abortion on demand within 40 days is not generally widely accepted, adopted, uh, agreed upon. And here you, Rabbi Unterman is giving us a rationale why, because even though technically it has this designation as Maya Baalma, no, uh, it's still within the Darko Shalom to be considered to be considered uh, life. Um and um, and and so that's what Rabbi Yontem says. You can't do abortion on the man for forty days. He actually he said he actually wants to prohibit abortion even within the first forty days. When Rabbi Yaakov Ariel, a contemporary uh, chief rabbi of Ramat Gan, dealt with this in source number six, he he quotes Rabbi Yontem's position, who wanted to forbid abortion for less than forty days. He says, "Ach, any yodea minayin lamadzos." I don't think the fact that you can save the fetus within forty days on Shabbos and you know, that's considered to be koach nefesh is it, it's he says it's apples and oranges. There's no, you know, Jewish law can separate between saving it and killing it. And you know, you're not allowed to kill it, but you are obligated and allowed to save it and break Shabbos to save it. Um, and um, and he says, you know, and, and, and even though that's not alive, still you can save it. You, you have to be able to hold both ideas at the same time. And uh, Rabbi Ariel you know, writing, you know, in contemporary times when a lot has been uh, done and explored and seen with regards to, you know, different stages of pregnancy and different reasons for, you know, for considering uh, taking, you know, steps or, you know, uh, you know situations today. Again, uh, a larger discussion on abortion, but when Judaism does permit abortion in different times and different trimesters and different periods, usually relates to different categories of viability impact it has on the mother's health, physical and mental, things of that sort. So this idea of, you know, from, from a Jewish law perspective, um, and it, you, you may look at the, uh, you know, the, 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 this idea that uh, we, we saw Rabbi Drummer saying, no, embryo is not a life. Uh, the first 40 days is Maya Bahama, so certainly the frozen embryo is not a life. You have Rabbi Unterman saying, well, the first 40 days it might be a life, so maybe that extends even extra extra uterinally, if that's a word. And then you will have uh, Rabbi Ariel uh, kind of saying, well, you know, it's not, it, it's a little bit more of a gray area. You know, as Rabbi J. David Bleich, who's a contemporary uh, scholar, uh, an expert in, in, in lots of areas of Jewish law, but especially uh, medicine and bioethics, acceptance of a distinction between in utero and ex utero gestation will lead to the conclusion that where the scenario depicted in Huxley's Brave New World, not to remain within the realm of science fiction, but to become reality, a human being conceived in vitro and allowed to develop in a laboratory incubator for the full nine-month period of gestation might be killed with impunity at any stage of life. Such a conclusion is certainly counterintuitive. Right? This idea of looking at it, you know, whether if it's in the womb, it's alive, out of the womb, not could lead to lots of uh, complicated issues uh, in general. It's interesting to note that um, colleague of mine uh, brought uh, to my attention that uh, Rabbi Black's argument was actually presented by the plaintiffs in the Alabama case. And the court considered it a good argument, but it was really not necessary because that decision didn't distinguish between ex utero and in utero uh, with regard to the law that they were dealing with. You know, for Alabama, they were saying that it was just based on that original law and based on that 1872 law and the the prohibitive uh, uh, laws against abortion in Alabama it wasn't necessary, but Rabbi Bly has a good case. It's a brave new world in which we live in, in which case you may develop a whole person outside of, of uh, you know, ex externally, where well, you're just going to kill that person because he's not, he's not, he wasn't uh, gestated within the womb. And so, um, you know, so it, it becomes, 
you know, he, he doesn't want to make a clear distinction. You can't just say if it's inside, you can't do anything. And if it's outside, you can do anything. However, for the most part, many, uh, many scholars, many rabbis have said that, you know, the, 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 the frozen embryos do constitute something different for the fact that they're outside and it, it's so early. Kind of if you combine the within 40 days, right, this is really, this is just fertilized eggs with the, uh, the fact that it's still outside of the uterus, they're willing to uh, allow for uh, destruction of these embryos as needed. And this impacts stem cell research and it impacts, uh, you know, as was mentioned in the, in the article, in the Times article before, IVF. So, for example, Rabbi Moshe Sternbuch is one of them to make the uh, observation. It would seem that the prohibition source number eight against abortion applies to embryos that are in a woman's uterus that will develop and mature on their own in her uterus and one destroys them. Here, however, they're outside the uterus and operations still required to implant them in women's uterus. And without this, they will not reach maturity on their own. So in my humble opinion, it is obvious that this is not called abortion. And there is likewise no murder here at all. You know, so he's dealing with a situation, and you know, one of the th situations which has become more common in this day and age, um, you know, as it pertains to this you know, this topic, uh, you know, revolves around the procedure that they call PIGD or PGD, pre-implementation genetic diagnosis. That you know, it's, you know, in general, IVF is viewed as complicated. For example, like Rabbi Sternbach is not in favor. It's not in the source here. He's not in favor of IVF per se, because it involves you know, certain actions which outside the norm, outside the religious norm, right? You're basically taking the sperm and the egg outside and fertilizing the egg. But to do that, you have to take the egg and you have to take the sperm. And taking the sperm from the man uh, is uh, can be complicated by the fact that Judaism has very strong words against uh, seminal emission outside of sexual relations. So it becomes complicated. Um, so uh, Rabbi Schoenbach is not really so positive on IVF in general. Um, it, it's for the most part, most halachic authorities are accepting of this as needed. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 so, but, but Rabbi Schoenbach does note that if you have this situation uh, where you have a fertilized uh, egg, you have the embryo outside of the womb, he sees that Clearly, um, there's greater allowance. You're not entering a discussion about abortion in that type of a situation. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Jachter has quoted Rabbi Zalman Nehemia Goldberg, source nine, told me that he believes a fertilized egg does not have the status of human life. He explained that an act must occur, transfer into the woman's womb, in order for the fertilized egg to develop, so its status differs from fertilized ova in the mother's womb, which develop independently. And he's not really pushing the envelope as far as Rabbi Black did. I would imagine he would have similar... Uh, reservations about uh, uh, killing a lab-grown human being, you know, because we're not there yet. You know, but uh, he agrees this idea, which if we're talking about an embryo outside uh, of the womb in these early days, uh, you are uh, not entering the abortion minefield or the like. And as you know, Rabbi Mordechai Elio says, source number ten: all fertilized eggs which are destined to be implanted in the mother's womb should not be destroyed, as if live fetus will yet develop from them. But those eggs which have not been chosen for implementation may be uh, discarded, and um, you know that in particular is you know what's going on. You know, in addition to stem cell research, that's what's going on in pre-implementation genetic diagnosis, where you have situations where there is a great concern for uh, some of the Jewish genetic diseases to be passed down. You have a husband and a wife who turn out to be carriers for you know a a, a uh, uh, Tay Sachs, God forbid, type of a situation. Um, and uh, you know, in general, that's why many encourage genetic testing in advance of, of a couple getting married. But sometimes the reality is, you know, they're in love, they're engaged, nothing's going to change. What do you do in that type of a situation? So what uh, pre-implementation pre genetic diagnosis does is that multiple embryos are created and screened for the gene that causes the disease. And the embryos that don't have the gene are implanted uh, uh, in the womb, and those that have the gene are destroyed. And, um, you know, that's uh, as Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein notes, and you know, the Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein is a, a major rabbinic authority in the, you know, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, uh, son-in-law of Rabbi El Yashiv. Those eggs that are vulnerable to disease source 11 is permitted to not implant them, it is even permitted to destroy them, as there's no prohibition on this. These fertilized eggs that are found outside the uterus do not have the status of a nephesh. And one who destroys them is not in the category of a destroyer of a nephesh. 
now, you know, a destroyer of a soul, how that pertains to saving, right? You know, what kind of actions can be done on Shabbos to save to save embryos? I, I'm not sure exactly, you know, the, the, the specific situation that can be constructed. You know, the, the power goes out in the freezer, you carry outside without an air of... I, I don't think Rabbi Zilberstein was countenancing in, in general these types of scenarios. Um, you know, one of the, the halakhic issues that the rabbi spent more time on has to do with ensuring that that uh, ensuring that the you know the right embryos the, the the chain of possession is maintained and, and that the embryos are actually the product of the people that the the sperm and the egg that chain of uh, of possession is, is is clear that it's the, that man and that woman and that embryo and those are the parents and that led to our conversation previously you know what happens when mix-ups take place and that in the I guess in the the what, the, the, the the Jewish fertility scene uh, is taught is what they talk about having a uh, supervision hashkacha for uh, for embryos is kind of an interesting way of putting it you have hashkacha for eggs well you know generally hashkacha for eggs isn't that something that we're so worried about maybe you check the ones you cook with for blood spots maybe another discussion but uh, hashkacha for eggs here is this idea of ensuring you know that, that paternity and maternity can be uh, insured uh, from a halachic perspective but what you see, you know, what, what we have seen is a, a progression from uh, the, the, the initial Jewish source talks about Maya Ba'alma. So you have a lot of flexibility. And that was even you know, followed by one view to say, really, the first 40 days is completely anything goes. Those who say that you really can't be as uh, uh, you can't be as you can't be as open uh, with in, in applying that across the board. And there is this idea of still maintaining a certain level, a certain type of sanctity differentiating between inside the uterus, outside the uterus, of course, Rabbi Bly's concern that you can't take this into the brave new world territory. And for the most part, rabbinic authorities have been more uh, permissive in terms of uh, recognizing these uh, embryos that are outside uh, the womb in, in that, as having more flexibility, not entering into the uh, complicated terrain uh, of abortion. Uh, we'll look at maybe one other perspective in a minute, but we'll stop for questions and comments. Yeah, Hirsch, I see you just unmuted. No, 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 you muted. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting for Miriam. I see she has a question. Oh, so. all right. My, my question, it's not really, it's a point that do they take into consideration that even, you know, with the case of IVF, a very small percentage of these attempts really make it to to a, a, a good pregnancy. Right. So, no, I, so I think that that, you know, I think that that, um, I think that's a reality. I think that when the, you know, especially, you know, that, that, that pertains a little bit to Rabbi Unterman and Rabbi Ariel that we saw earlier on. Yeah. I mean, I think recognizing that there may be longer odds than people would hope for, but there's still... This is the derecha olam. This is where you want to go. You know, the, I say, you know, if this works, and that's enough to categorize this as you know the begin some form of nefesh that you know certainly to counter, you know, uh, Rabbi Drimmer's you know all things go first forty day situation. Um, you know that is the reality, and you know the, you know in particular that you know that that, that I, I think factors into the flexibility that we see maintained through you know most of the views that uh, are willing to recognize the ability to discard you know uh, the, the you know the, the you know we recognize that this, it's not a sure thing it's not that every fertilized egg is going to lead to a you know a viable child i think that right. definitely is part of the thinking and also i just wanted to note that in alabama it's got the country's largest uterine transplant program mm -hmm. And oh, these people are dependent on it. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's why in the immediacy afterwards, you saw, you know, things shutting down, trying to change the laws. You know, the, the, actually, I'm saying out of the politics and in the uh, the, the business, side, I'll stick to the halacha side. Okay. Stay, in your, stay in your lane, Rabbi. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so um, interesting story. This is actually, you know, Masa Shahaya. This actually happened a close friend of mine. Close, lost a child to this uh, genetically Jewish genetically linked disease called family dysautonomia, FD. And, um, okay, I don't want to go into all the details. I don't want to reveal who it was, but um, 
So they went through, they wanted to have another child and they didn't want to go through this again. So um, a test was uh, developed to test the, uh, the gene uh, to see if the, if the, if the uh, embryo had the gene, but apparently this could only be performed in utero. For some reason, they couldn't do the testing in the in the laboratory of a fertilized egg. It had to be implanted in the mother first, and then the testing, and then they could draw, you know, draw, do, do the testing in utero. Mm. And they got a psak from no less than Rabbi Moshe Tend Rabbi Tendler, saying that they could implant several embryos in the mother simultaneously test if one of them had was you know was okay did not have to but did not have the gene and if the other did they could abort the child that had the gene because of this idea that you said of what is it sofo what, what what's the phrase uh, uh oh, sofo? Of, oh, yeah yeah bishum sofo right mm -hmm. and that's in fact what they did and they had a beautiful baby and the kid is just uh just a terrific kid and has grown up has his own kids and uh you know it's uh but huh? it's it's a difficult case right because he actually permitted aborting something but you know oh well, what's the something and that's the but what's the something exactly it was and it had to be it? before had to be before 30 days or 40 days or 40 whatever. days right right yeah. it's, it's interesting in general rabbi moshe feinstein rabbi tendler is uh, father-in-law was known for yeah. very restrictive views on abortion. Oh, really? Okay. Um, you know, again, you know, I, I, I don't. Yeah, the, the situations can be very different. They've, you know, Rabbi Salvechik is is quoted as having been restrictive on abortion, but when encountering you know specific situations of Tay-Sachs, you know, was known to uh, be understanding of a more uh, permissive view right. uh, of aborting. You know, into up to a certain point in the pregnancy, if you found out. Um, what's interesting? What would have happened in that case, uh, in, in in your case, Hirsch, if the um, let, let's say both uh, you know both right. embryos were found viable? They could have ended up with I don't, I don't know how that works exactly. Good but, question. Um, I don't know. Good question. But it, it, you know, it's it's kind of it, it is a you know could have gone an interesting direction that way. But uh, yeah, you know that that, that, that but uh, right, you know. So the, the, you know the, these are still ma'asim shehayu as much as you try to. To, you know, to plan everything and and without having to engage in it, but uh, it still happens. Phyllis, you have your hand up. I, I have to unmute. I I just wanted to share um, uh, a um, a true story of the havoc that um, Jewish genetic diseases can can hold on a, a person's life, a family, and a community. One of our dear members, Al, would know, uh, her son uh, married a British girl, and she conceived while they were living in England. Uh, and then they moved to Israel, and blood tests were taken, and uh, they thought they took the test for Tay-Sachs. Uh, fast forward, they never did. The child was born, and uh, they moved to the States, and uh, ended up with Tay Sachs. The entire community was involved. The most beautiful child. He he died when he was four, unfortunately, and uh, the marriage went kaput. It it's just it it just right. seems to me all of these restrictions on on um, you know testing are are just really cruel. We have the ability now, and when the state takes away this ability. It, to me, it's an infringement on my religious rights. Uh, the, um, no, the, 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 the it, it is uh, tragic, and it, there are ways of avoiding it. I, you know, genetic testing, we can have a share on that too. Um, that that, uh, that uh, you know, I, I'll wait for the headline. But no, it, it, it is something that happens all the time. I get questions about genetic testing. One of the things that I'm I try as a rabbi to do when meeting a couple who comes. Uh, who's getting married and they're asking for me to officiate or be involved is to is to, uh, is to you know begin with some very uh, non-romantic topics like genetic testing and uh, halakha krina 
right? You know, so we're, we're, we're talking about everything possible that can go wrong before we start talking about what could go right. So it's, um, you're so, a real romantic, but, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Okay. Correct. Correct. Um, so there's, uh, there, there, so there's that piece to it. So just let, let's finish up by uh, the sources by just mentioning there's, um, you know, there, there were, for the most part, you know, what we've seen until now is what, what's accepted practice, you know, in terms of PIGD, in terms of permitting stem cell research. And, you know, I would say that there's probably, you know, more sympathy, uh, you know, for the more permissive views within for abortion within halacha. And I think it's it's a longer conversation, but I think certain, to me, there are two really very big, you know, medical issues in halacha that have, you know, kind of, you know, a strict side and a more permissive side that the strict side carried forth and was the dominant approach for a long time and seems to have shifted in, in the minds of many. And, um, it, it, and a lot of it, you know, part of it may have to do just with how people are responding. One of them is abortion. Like I said, Robin Moshe was very strict on abortion. And then as you move forward, you know, into contemporary times through the 20th century, the late 20th century into today, this idea of, you know, of either trying to avoid it by PIGD uh, or genetic testing or recognizing and, and, and factoring in more um, the viability, both in terms of the, the child and in terms of what it means for the mental health and future family prospects of the family, there seems to have been a, more of a pivot. And the, the, those more the, those views which are less black and white about abortion are seem to be the dominant ones and similar to the case in IVF. The other one, which is another conversation completely, has to do with, uh, with, with uh, organ donation and, and in particular brain death, what they call. Is brain death considered death in order to transplant the various organs, especially the heart, for example, you can only do so from quote unquote live donors. Live donors are those who have no brainwave activity but are still being kept alive artificially. And what you do is you take the heart while it's still beating technically, but according to medical uh, protocols and according to uh, secular law, the patient is considered dead. What does Judaism say about that? And, you know, and that too, uh, you know, you know, if you go back in the 60s, 70s, 80s was a major uh, machloket. Really, the, the two sides, on the one side, you had Rabbi Tenler, you know, invoking Rabbi Feinstein, is saying that brain death is considered halachic death also, and the transplantation was alive, allowed. You had Rabbi Blythe really much on the other side. You had Rabbi Schechter in the middle saying it's a doubt, and, you know, suffix, nefasha, you know, and it's, a, so you're really not allowed to do the, the transplants. And I think that, you know, the, 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 that a lot of the, the halachic uh, opinions are moving more towards uh, allowing these types of uh, organ donations because of um, because of looking at brain death differently, and not completely. It, it, a lot of it has to do with that in Israel. A lot of the poskim were are more permissive. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Arbach, Rabbi Avram Sternberg, Rabbi Doctor Avram Sternberg, the chief you know, that's the chief rabbinate's position, and, and, and organ donation has been encouraged. And we've seen numerous stories, uh, you know, especially since October seventh, of soldiers who had to save five different lives, including Arabs who needed organ donations. There just seems to be uh, a, a, a shift into which halachic positions are more uh, are, are more prevalent. But it, one contrary view in this case emerged from Rabbi Shlomo Duchovsky, who was uh, one of the senior dayanim in the Israeli Supreme Rabbinical Court uh, via marriage, uh, a relative of Nama. And it was a, t t a situation between a husband and wife who were estranged and were fighting over the impl implantation into the wife of previously created embryos, which the wife desired and the husband opposed. Right, so you have these situations that the you know, and this is it can happen often. You have the couples divorcing, and the wife wants it, and the husband says no. We're entering a, a, a very kind of brave new world that's happening now with the situation in Israel when. They're talking about, and this might be the subject of another class, um, you know, soldiers who were killed in action, um, taking sperm out and allowing them to essentially have children after they're already dead. And how that works, is it halachically allowed? What's the paternity? Another brave new world situation. But this case was a real world situation of the wife uh, fight over the, the embryos. Um, so the, the 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 panel that heard this case in Israel uh, 
they sided with the husband on various points. You know, so he had a say in the matter. But Rabbi Dachowski sided uh, with the wife. And uh, the source, uh, number 12, uh, sums up uh, his position, as mentioned by Rabbi Chaim Jachter. Rabbi Dachowski rules that the implementation should be permitted even absent the husband's consent. He argues that once the egg has been fertilized, it attains a life of its own. And neither husband nor wife retains any ownership rights in the fertilized eggs. Rabbi Dachowski asserts that therefore neither the husband nor the wife enjoys the right to destroy the pre-embryo. Regarding the argument that it's better for such a child not to be born, Rabbi Dachowski writes, just as no one would justify an abortion in such circumstances, so too no one should prevent the continued development of a fertilized egg. He concludes, in my opinion, also from a moral perspective, we do not enjoy the right to destroy a kernel of life for whatever reason. And so you see, if you take that to other situations, there could be a more you know restrictive view on this. Uh, on this, what if they're going to be discarded anyway? In, in like a PGD situation, that's this is just a view, a snapshot of a view of a more contrarian view of Rabbi Chosky within a within this basket of laws. Uh, you know, uh, we have to go further afield to explore Rabbi Chosky's views on the other situations <laughs> that we saw. But it's just, uh, you, know, if we're, you know, we see all the, 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 the preponderance of views is heading in the direction of allowing this and being open to it. You know, seeing Rev. Dachowski's view in that case is certainly pulls us back just uh, just a little bit. Uh, and look, you know, he, the, the, certainly, you know, one of the, you know, the, the, the idea of recognizing, you know, the, the value of nefesh, which has you know, recurred several times in some of the sources, whether this is a nefesh, pikuach nefesh, you know, the, the idea, look, in general, we are, we are uh, we, we we believe in expanding nefesh as much as possible, uh, and you know the, the the fullest form of nefesh uh, being you know being preserved, maintained, and expanded certainly is uh, a very Jewish uh, concept. But with regards to this specific situation, you know Judaism definitely has a more you know permissive approach uh, than uh, the Catholics and the Pope, and um, you know w- would very likely you know take a different look uh, to the uh, to the uh, Alabama Supreme Court's uh, decision, while recognizing that in general Judaism is, doesn't like to make blanket pronouncements. You know, for the most people, it's Judaism pro life or pro choice. I always say Judaism is the most pro choice because we believe in free choice, uh, But I think Judaism doesn't really want to take a, a blanket yes yes abortion no abortion. We we are we are definitely you know pro life in the nefesh. Uh, uh, approach to all of this, and uh, hopefully uh, to life to life uh, l'chaim. So um, we are happy to take uh, any questions, reactions, and please God, we'll continue next week. Uh, I-